and I'm going to give a quick talk about Glaze. Thank you all for attending. Um, we appreciate you taking some time out of your day to learn about the activities in the controlled environment agriculture world. Today, we are featuring some presenters from the Virginia Tech and IALR combined CEA Innovation Center, and we're excited to hear about the research they're doing. Glaze is a public-private partnership based out of Cornell University, and we've been around for about six years. We seek to transform greenhouse lighting and systems management to support climate smart agriculture, and we research and educate to help save growers money, commercialize emerging technology, and reduce the carbon footprint of greenhouse operations. So to do that, we do research, education, and networking. So at Cornell, Rensselaer Polytech, as well as Rutgers, our three academic institution partners, we research in greenhouses and indoor farms to investigate emerging technologies, see how they benefit crops, as well as maybe energy, business benefits, and benefits to the environment. We share insights from experts, from our own researchers, as well as from those around the industry, as you can see today at webinars. And we also hold short courses, which consolidate that information into about six weeks of content. And we do those at least once a year to develop the controlled environment agriculture workforce. And we, as a public-private partnership, have industry members, individual members, and grower members that build community with us, generate business together, and just get to know people in the industry that think and look and work like them. We have 29 industry members and are glad to be supported by a diverse group of manufacturers and growers. And so we've had some great webinars this year. They're all recorded and available online. We hope that you watch them and we hope that you think about attending the last couple webinars of the year. Next month, we are featuring Agritecture, talking about design considerations for large scale CEA. And in November, we're hearing from the University of Georgia about the effects of light spectrum on nutrient uptake. We're currently planning our 2024 webinar series. And if you have anything of interest that you want to hear about, feel free to reach out and look for announcements about that when we have the details. So feel free to join us next month. It's going to be on October 19th, same time, same place. And to register, you can go on our website and check out past webinars and register for this one. I'm going to transition now to the presentation from our uh, esteemed speakers. And while I do that, I encourage them to give a short introduction, maybe starting with Michael. Sure, thank you very much, Gretchen. I am, I am Michael Evans. I serve as the director of the School of Plant and Environmental Sciences at Virginia Tech. I also serve as um, one of the associate directors of the our Control Environment Ag Innovation Center that is a joint project between Virginia Tech and the Institute for Advanced Learning and Research near Danville. Um, and I do a little bit of um, research in controlled environment agriculture as well. And I will start out my presentation today with a little bit of a background on our center so that you're more aware of us if you don't know us, and, but uh, we know what we're accomplishing and what we're doing. Um, I'm going to hand that off after that introduction to Dr. Kaylee South, who's going to share a project we're doing in conjunction with Canon. Uh, we'll share as much of that as we can. Some of that is proprietary, so we're going to share everything that we're allowed to. And then we're going to hand that off to Mitchell Doss, who is a graduate student doing quite a bit of work in optics on something referred to as our smart tables. So I'll do the introduction and then we'll hand it off with to people that are much, much smarter than I am. So. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, that would be great. So I do wanna give you background that the partners in the CEA IC that have founded that and work largely in that area uh, would be the School of Plant and Environmental Sciences at Virginia Tech, the Virginia Seafood Agricultural Research and Extension Center based in Hampton, uh, Virginia. You might be surprised seeing Seafood AREC but uh, that center also does a lot of aquaculture and aquaponics, and they have a lot of great technology experts yeah, that, that contribute to the effort, and that's their role. The Institute for Advanced Learning and Research in Danville, Virginia, which is an, an entity of the state of Virginia focused on research, uh, outreach, workforce training, all aimed at economic development. And then we have another uh, industry partners that work with us 
as well as sort of government and quasi-government entities in Virginia, such as Go Virginia, the Virginia uh, Tobacco Commission and Economic Development Offices are all part of this team. Next slide. When we came together, and, and this is a little bit like what uh, we heard Gretchen discussing on the goals, we're very similar. Our goal was creating this partnership that would create an ecosystem around CEA and CEA technologies, bringing together Virginia Tech and other entities as well. We wanted to assist the state in attracting CEA production companies to the state as well as allied support companies that could come to Virginia that would build that industry in Virginia and create jobs as well, particularly in areas um, that needed that economic development. We wanted to do research with lots of entities, either existing companies or with faculty, so for example, here at Virginia Tech to create new CEA technologies that could uh, become spin-off companies, for example, again, job development, and one thing that we do quite a bit and plan on doing a lot more is for those companies that come or for people that want to take advantage of those jobs, we look to do quite a bit of workforce training um, and skill developments in conjunction with various state entities and companies. Next slide. So hopefully this, this was a picture I could pull from satellite. And it's interesting, as you know, you'll, these will always be out of date. But um, I did want to share with you, you may not be familiar with the Institute. This is the core center. There's more buildings related to the Institute that go off screen, but the larger central building there. Um, and I don't know whether, I, do I have control of the mouse, Gretchen? No, but I can point out things for you. Okay. Well, that's marvelous. That building where you are now with your, um, with your mouse, that contains offices. It contains an auditorium, a large ballroom, meeting rooms. Um, as you'll hear later, we just hosted the Indoor AgCon East Conference. It was outstanding and it was great because we have all those facilities in-house there that we can host actually relatively moderately, not large, large, but moderately large uh, conventions or conferences around CEA, as well as um, smaller training sessions. So it's nice to have that in-house. And then one of those wings going to the right is actually research labs, analytical labs. And we have everything from uh, sterile labs doing tissue culture, plant pathology, uh, some really outstanding analytical labs, and all these things support our CEA work. Gretchen, if you slide down, you'll see a couple of greenhouse structures that look identical with attached buildings. I'm showing you the picture to the right of one of those. Basically, each one of these is um, polycarbonate glazed greenhouses, pan and fan and pad cooling systems, Wadsworth controls, computer controls, uh, natural gas unit heating, pretty standard, but they are BSL2 rated. And they, they're identical, each of these structures. The solid buildings that you see attached on one of those is more of an engineering type of laboratory. And the other one is, it's actually set up with our indoor vertical reach facility. So a couple of, of buildings and four large greenhouses make up most of our center. They're outfitted with lots of things that I'll show you as well as then the main building giving us conference, convention, training spaces, offices, and research labs uh, to support what we're doing. Next slide, please. So just to give you an idea, uh, in our facility, we've got lots of different systems so that we're able to do lots of different types of research. We have NFT, nutrient film technique systems. Uh, currently in that, in the one you see, for example, is set up with we use typically amhydro propagation systems and, um, and GrowTech, or excuse me, um, I'm trying to think of the company right now. Uh, it'll come to me in a minute and then I'll tell you after I, uh, after I think of that. But different systems, this is our NF2. We've set up with smaller systems so that, for example, in this greenhouse, we have a system set up with 20 independent zones. So we've learned some lessons. We've gone smaller systems with more zones to give us much, much greater capacity uh, to conduct experiments, because as you know, that tank can limit you. Um, so independent tanks, completely independent systems. 
We have um, strawberry gutter systems. Next slide, please. Uh, well, you know, we use this one. This is some of our Dutch buckets and you can't see anything behind it. So I, I meant to swap that one out with the, with the hemp, but we have Dutch bucket systems set up in one greenhouse. I believe we have a, a dozen independent tanks set up with that that we often do cucumber or strawberry research, or we, we have done some hemp uh, research, but we do have Dutch bucket systems. Next. Uh, inside of our vertical facility, we um, have vertical racks, and this is where we do most of our indoor ag type of work. Um, we have, Kaylee, help me out if I forget, but we have probably about maybe a 10 or 12 independent zones in there, something like that. And we have both open face and closed face. The type of research we're doing in there it varies from uh, spinach work, lettuce work, microgreens work. Uh, we've also done work that is um, working with things like the super dwarf tomatoes, so trying to work at developing alternative crops. In this facility, we can control light quantity, quality, and uh, duration. Uh, we have control over CO2, uh, airflow, temperature, and humidity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just another picture of some of our standard racks systems that we have in our indoor vertical facility. And next slide, please. Just quickly, uh, we put together a very nice team. Uh, Scott Lohman is a, originally did molecular work. He is one of our associate directors. He's based at ILR. Uh, Amy Turner is an ILR technician employee that runs a lot of ex experiments. Dr. May is a microbiologist and plant pathologist who's an IALR employee. Then Dr. Kaylee South, you'll meet today, is a Virginia Tech employee based at the center. Michael Schwartz is an uh, aquaculture and aquaponics specialist, director of the Seafood AREC, and he's very involved in our center. Myself, then other faculty at Virginia Tech. Uh, Bing Yu Zhao is uh, in plant breeding. John McDowell is um, a pathology specialist. Mitchell Doss is one of our master students will be speaking today. And Sharif Sharif is also working with us. And he's really in fruits, but he has some real um, interesting specialties related to uh, disease and pest control that he's now applying into the Controlled Environment Act facility. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a background on sort of who we are and what we do. And I think you could move to the, the next slide. And uh, just as a final, before we pass it off, I just wanted to share, you know, people want to know, well, what are you working on? Um, it's, it's actually quite a lot of things because all of those people are bringing specialties and applying it to different things. But uh, we're doing a lot of aquaponics, fertilizer management, waste management, doing a lot of work with beneficial endophytes, uh, beneficial bacteria, if you will, looking at new dwarf pepper and tomato crops. Just received a nice grant on looking at interference RNA as an alternative pest control management tool to work on that in CEA. And then finally, we're doing uh, work in the area of optics, which will be our next speaker. And I believe, Gretchen, that's a good place to mentioning optics work is to hand that off to the next speaker. You could just go ahead and go forward. Thank you. So Kaylee, I will hand that off to you. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Evans. So I am, um, my name is Kaylee South. I am um, an assistant professor in the School of Plant and Environmental Sciences at Virginia Tech. I am located in Danville, Virginia at IELR, um, where the CEA Innovation Center is located. Um, so as Dr. Evans mentioned, there we do have part of our center. One of our goals is to be able to collaborate with um, different industry partners in various ways. As he mentioned, we work with them in developing uh, workforce training programs and helping them to inform our research that we are doing, um, as well as um, looking at other types of educational programs. One industry collaboration that we wanted to highlight, that we wanted to tell you a little about, is our collaborative, collaborative project with Canon Virginia, Inc. Um, so this is a project that um, where we are working with them 
um, to conduct several different um, research projects as part of a, a larger goal, looking at uh, utilizing imaging technologies to capture various um, uh, issues with plant with plants, so different plant health issues. So to start off and tell you a little bit about Canon Virginia. So it is located in Virginia and it is the only manufacturing, engineering, recycling and technical support center in the Americas region. Um, they specializing in producing new products. They have their expert customer service located there. And they also specialize in repair and refurbishment of um, Canon uh, products. And so um, here in this picture is the team that came down to establish the test bed and start uh, launch off this research project that we were doing in collaboration with them. Um, so we are a mix of IALR, Virginia Tech, and Canon researchers and experts. Uh, next slide. All right, so um, like I mentioned, this project is housed at IELR in Danville and is led by the Virginia Tech SPES researchers that are located there, um, I, working with the Canon team uh, that we started this project in 2022. The overall goal of this project is to use imaging technology to discover symptoms of diseases in an early stage. Um, and right now we're working within CEA facilities. And this is um, a picture of the greenhouse. So one of those greenhouses that Dr. Evans was showing on the map, this is the one that we have it located in. And this is a greenhouse where we have, it's our dirty greenhouse is what we call it. So we use it um, to run our pathogen and pest experiment so that we can inoculate plants to be able to capture the images. Um, so the uh, goal of this project is to eventually be able to have it used by growers to identify plant health concerns. Next slide. So um, uh, I'm just going to give like just a very broad overview of some of the projects that we have running with them with working with the Canon team. Um, so we are looking at the detection of anomalies caused by um, all nutrients, so nutrient deficiencies, plant pathogens, as well as insect pests. Um, and I'm going to focus on um, the projects that we have running in our NFT systems. Um, we are doing some projects as well with Dutch buckets, um, but right now we're focusing a lot on nutrient deficiency um, with later moving into plant pathogens and insect pest issues caused by those. And so um, looking at this image, this is um, our current setup. So we're interested in um, under, or being able to capture um, deficiency symptoms at different rates of um, deficiency of like a specific nutrient. Um, so uh, actually Mitchell, who is you're gonna hear from in a little while, um, retrofitted these systems for us and designed them so that we can have um, six different rates going at a time. So for instance, um, like iron, we would want to have like a 0% iron rate up to um, maybe like two times the rate. And so we're looking at um, uh, uh, causing these issues so that we can capture the images to be able to later use um, in collaboration with a Canon team. So we have these two NFT systems that look like this. And just to give you an idea of how this collaboration is working is that we're kind of, um, we're the plant experts and the experimental design experts. And so we're looking at developing these projects and these systems and then working with them and their their um, imaging capturing um, technology that they have to be able to get those images and then um, perform the image analysis, and then we work together to develop the next projects. Next slide. And so this is just another, um, a few other photos of some of the projects that we have going. Um, we started out looking at lettuce, strawberries, and basil, looking at some different, um, what that would look like across different species. Um, and then uh, the picture on the far right is looking at a, um, 0% rate of one of the nutrients that we're looking at. And so what we do is that we look at all of these different rates and then we select the ones that we're the most interested in that's going to give us the best results that we need for our project goals. And then we take that and replicate it and to um, have lots of plants for lots of images. And um, you can go to the next slide. 
Um, so then um, this is actually um, from uh, this morning, um, looking at um, uh, another uh, deficiencies, uh, looking at um, boron deficiency with a low and high rate. Um, and, and you can't see it in these images. And again, as Dr. Evans mentioned at the beginning, um, we do have some proprietary information. So we do have to be, um, be a bit careful, but whenever we're, you're looking at these images above these plants, we have created um, these projects so that we have these NFT systems running with the plants in them. And then above that, what you're not seeing is a gantry system with um, various imaging technology um, uh, that is being tested as well as lights um, that are needed um, in uh, for this experiment. You can go to the next slide. And then um, this is just uh, an example of what we're capturing right now. And again, we're kind of like in the earlier stages of this collaboration as we're um, in the middle of collecting data. So this is just an example of kind of what we're looking at, what we're looking for. So on the left, uh, in the left photo, you can see um, what we're seeing, the different concentrations of iron from 25% um, is the highest in this system down to 0%. Um, and then the picture on the right is what the image, what we're capturing is um, as, a, as the data we're collecting at the moment. And then next slide. And then um, from this, what we're doing is we're continuing with um, doing lots of different um, nutrient uh, studies with different nutrient deficiencies. And then we're moving into insect pests as well as pathogens. And then we're going to use these results as we capture them to be able to develop, um, uh, to be able to understand more about how the different symptoms are progressing over time. And then using that information to eventually build a um, program or to uh, develop this technology further to be able to assist growers so they can use it to not only identify, but then also identify these um, issues early, but then also to um, uh, be able to um, identify what the remedial possibilities would be to be able to implement those earlier um, once the symptoms are detected using the technology that's being developed. And I believe that may be my last slide um, in this slide deck. And so I will turn it over to Mitchell um, to uh, talk a little bit more about some of the um, imaging technology that's being used or, or that we're using right now at IELR in the Innovation Center. Hello, uh, my name is Mitchell Doss. I'm a master's student at Virginia Tech at the School of Plant and Environmental Science. And I uh, have the wonderful opportunity to work with the Spatially and Mechanically Accurate Robotic Table or Smart Platform. Um, the images provided right here are the original smart table design that I was introduced to in 2014-2015 as an intern uh, at the Institute through the Academy of Engineering and Technology. Um, these designs were uh, implemented by Dr. Uh, Scott Lohman for his PhD research. And uh, the main premise of the smart table is to track and image plant growth from uh, transplant or uh, sowing of seed to end harvest date or to the end of the experiment. Um, and the actual technology is based off of uh, ballistics testing in the military. Uh, they would actually have the gantry system uh, look for shrapnel on the wall post uh, explosives. Um, now, just looking at the system in the old version, it's a little bit larger, uh, has quite a bit of a few uh, larger stepper motors. And it's just a pretty much a three axis gantry system that's outfitted with uh, imaging technology, fully integrated within a growing system. Um, and the really cool thing that came out of this project in the upper right corner is a, a cooperation between the uh, Virginia Tech engineering program and the Institute. And they've kind of developed their own little, I guess I like to call it the brain of the system. Now, um, I come from, I'm in the horticulture field, so that looks a little scary in my opinion. So as a user of it, uh, when it comes to troubleshooting, if something goes wrong, that is a little bit past, uh, past my understanding. So uh, moving forward, just redesign it so it's more user-friendly was the goal in mind. Uh, so next slide, please. So this is the new Smart Table platform, uh, a little bit sleeker design, smaller stepper motors, um, and the uh, actual manufacturing of it is done in Lynchburg, Virginia through Alliance Industries. Uh, it's sent to our, whatever, our location and it's uh, 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 put together on site. 
Um, and a cool thing from the old one uh, to the new one is that it's 90 to 100% aluminum. So when you're dealing with plants, you're going to have irrigation, you're going to have water. Well, a big problem from the previous one is that we had a lot of rust issues. And this one, uh, we've kind of taken that problem out. Uh, the stepper motors are smaller, less uh, draw of energy, because all we're doing is really moving a uh, camera around to image plants. Uh, so uh, it's a little bit, I guess, like I said, user friendly in mind. Uh, go to the next slide, please. So this is just a little bit of a preview of the action of uh, the smart table. Uh, so each plant is, is has its own uh, coordinate system. Oh, did, is there, wait, was there not a slide previous to this one? My apologies. I was going off my notes. I'm missing a slide. Apparently. Oh. Oh, no. I only see this slide and then it goes to the video. Oh, there might be a, there might be, let's see if it's later. Oh, that. Uh, is it this one? Oh, go back. Sorry. that It's that one. So, okay, uh, here we go. All right. My apologies. It's uh, all right. So, um, the big going forward, I wanted to highlight this. So, we moved towards more open, uh, open source equipment to man the table. Um, whereas before, I mentioned that really complicated piece of equipment is a one of one. So, if problems occurred, uh, we really have a hard time deciding where I should troubleshoot first. So that's where we found this company called Open Builds, and they developed a, a, a tool called the Black Box and the uh, Memo Power Supply. The Black Box is, is what serves the brain. It's about, I would dare say, 75% smaller than what was developed by the uh, engineering program and the Virginia Tech and uh, the uh, Institute for Advanced Learning Research. And this one is what interprets the G code, what stores the functionalities of the table, um, whether move right, left, and how it interacts with the uh, system itself. Uh, and the power supply just is what connects and, and makes sure that it, it's uh, able to maintain power. Um, so uh, so this is, this is a, oh, sorry, I could go back, my apologies. Um, oh, to the, to the open builds one, my bad. Uh, so a positive about this is the, the fact that it is an open source piece of equipment. Um, if an error does occur, this machine is really common Oh, this, uh, this part is really common in a lot of CNC or uh, 3D printing pieces of equipment. So if there's an issue occurring that I can describe in Google or a, a forum um, or an error code that I'm getting feedback on, I can generally look on the internet and find a solution to that problem so I can get, my, the, get the table back up and running. Um, so can you go back to the video that was previous to that? Uh, yeah, so once you have all your components together, um, oh, yeah. Is it going to run? Oh, there we go. Oh, no. Is it? It should have a play. Moved last time. Let me hit play. There we go. Right, okay. It automatically yeah. played the first. <laughs> um, so this is a, kind of an example of it running. Once you have all the components together, this is it uh, treating each plant as a coordinate system. And uh, the movement of the, the gantry head is all G code, but the commands with it performing those certain G code tasks is Python. Um, so as it hovers over each image, it, it takes a snapshot, assigns that image to a folder. For example, plant one, it recognizes it's plant one, it gets sorted to plant one folder. Uh, snapshot plant two, sorted to plant two folder. So there's no really user interaction having to sort photos. So there's no confusion of whether or not, oh man, is this plant six or is this plant seven? Who knows? Um, so we're really uh, able to really uh, overload, you know, overload the table and able to, to assign a coordinate to each plant and capture it over time in a very accurate manner. All right, uh, next video, please. Oh, right, yeah. we played. Oh, there we go. Um, so just to highlight the accuracy of the said uh, coordinate system, you all look at this video and, and you see it's a video, but in actuality, it's a series of images captured by the smart table. And it's such a fluid and accurate uh, motion that it's actually just makes it look like we put a video over the plant and just recorded it. So that's just to show you how accurate um, said program is. So after we run an experiment, we're left with just RGB images. Um, and this is where the, really, I guess, so this is where the fun begins, I like to say. So this is a, a time a beginning photo, about a mid-range photo, and then the final photo taken in an experiment. Um, and so if you hit the next one, next slide, please. So this is what the output is. This is um, how we take the, uh, measure the pixels within those photos. Um, and, this, and so we're able to really just highlight plant material and remove all other pieces of noise in the background. 
uh, continue. And this is all made possible through open source image analysis programs. Uh, it really started out with ImageJ, uh, specifically the Fiji version, in which we could isolate and collect plant pixels. Uh, and, and really with Fiji, we're able to copy script in uh, isolating those pixels and apply it to folders. And I think even apply it to folders with subfolders in it. So that was really what we needed. But once we get to like 32 plants in an experiment, it kind of bogged down the Fiji program. So through the use of summer interns and a lot of manpower, we were able to recreate the um, the mechanics of ImageJ Fiji within a Python program. And we're able also with that uh, uh, improvements and, and staffing of, of really good interns over the summer, we are actually able to call back some motion detection code. Uh, so now we have two separate analysis for two separate data, um, derived of two different data sets. And a really thing I wanted to highlight on is the fact that we're starting out with an RGB image and we're going to a binary image to really um, assign these, these pictures a numerical value. And I wanna dive a little deeper in exactly like idea of color because you and me as a human being, we could look at an object and really not know and not really see the exact same color. Like I, I know I see the Python symbols blue and yellow, but I, I can never really explain and understand the color of blue or yellow that you're seeing. So now I have to communicate what I'm seeing with a computer, which is <laughs> another line of, of, of just a way to get confused, but also get what you really want. So I like to break it down. And the best way to describe it is, is I like to think of it as unit conversion. Some people like to think of it as applying like a filter or like a, a mask, they say. Um, so what, however way you want to tackle it within your mind, I'm going to do my best to explain it. So RGB is three variables associated with color, red, green, blue. And so when you're trying to isolate a singular color, you really want to try to remove as much, I guess, noise or the involvement of other colors. So by doing that, we shift, um, we, we move from RGB to HSV because it's all still talking about color and they all have units that are assigned that are transferable because it's all generally color. So it goes from a three variable RGB to a singular color of HSV. So let me explain HSV. HSV is hue saturation value. It can also be presented as hue saturation brightness. Um, hue is what the variable that's associated with color. Saturation is how much of that color and uh, view or brightness is how light or dark that said color is. So that means now we have a one color variable going from three to one. So that's where we apply our threshold. Since we can really manipulate and hone in on a singular color scale, that's when we say we want this specific color or green to really pull out what is plant material that we're getting in the images collected. From that point, we apply another scale or, or go to another value of, of grayscale. This is where it says, all right, the plant, the highlighted material that we really want is going to go toward a lighter scale value, more towards your white, light gray. Um, and then the plain, things that don't really meet that threshold of green get put into a, uh, I guess, darker, they go to a darker gray or go to a black. And then from that sets, that set definition, we go from that to binary. That means if you're, if you're white, it's, it, if it's white, it's white. And if it's black, it gets zoned out. So the white is then pulled through as plant material. And that's where we can count the, the leftover white pixels and really um, assign a numerical value to just a simple plant image of a plant. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, there we go. And so this, once you have a numerical value, you can then assign it and put it into graphs and charts and whatever you want to do with those data points. Um, you know, looking at this, you may be like, oh, that's just a, you know, simple, you know, linear graph. Like it's, I've seen hundreds of these. It's really surprising though, is that this graph is made out of 64,000 data points because it was derived from an experiment that had 32 plants. They ran for four weeks. Each plant collected 2000 images and, uh, and, you know, analyze each set of folders. So 2000 times 32, you get 64,000 images. And then further on, you're able to break it up into treatments. Uh, like this experiment was a fertilizer treatment. And then you're able to really see the impact of your treatments as it, uh, throughout the experiment. Proceed to the next slide. 
So um, I actually, uh, we mentioned earlier the CEA Summit. I actually was able to participate in my first poster competition where I really looked into validating uh, whether or not the smart table really could determine a difference between treatments. Um, so we, uh, Dr. South and I ran an experiment on the table looking at applying a hydroponic fertilizer to green oak leaf lettuce at rates of 0 0.25, 0.5, and 1. Um, and ran for about four weeks until the plant reached a mature, uh, mature size. During that whole entire period, the smart table was running, capturing images uh, ever since the beginning. Um, once, uh, once we reached the end, we let the table capture one final set of photos. Uh, we harvested the plants, took fresh weights, um, and then I took the final capture, uh, the final pixel, uh, uh, final captures of all the plants, ran it through the Python analysis code, got all the pixel values, um, and then took the fresh weight values and put it through uh, Jump, uh, the statistical software analysis, performed an ANOVA, a Tukey HSD, and then uh, fit it to a bivariate fit model. And what was determined is that, as expected, the fresh weight was able to determine a, 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 a treatment difference, but the pixel uh, number between treatments was also able to support a difference between treatments. And then later on, looking at uh, pixel versus shoot weight, we were actually uh, able to to uh, show a positive linear, linear correlation where the R squared value is 0.92. So it's getting really close to fitting to that line. Um, and it actually had a 95% correlation. So it really uh, showed that the smart table is a valid source of data collection for plant research, but it, um, it can really distinguish treatment differences. Um, so that, that was a really awesome uh, endeavor to take, take on this project. So I really enjoy it. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just another uh, example of the data that was derived and put to a linear graph or just a graph. Um, it doesn't have to do with fertilizers. This is just, well, it did, this one had to do with fertilizers, but they added a variable of heat and, uh, and also an endophyte with it too. So it's all about, you can manipulate the variables you apply to the plant and the smart table can image it from beginning to end. And you're able to take those collected images and uh, pretty much manipulate any Python code you want to really pick out what you want to, to um, really study on. Like I said, with plant growth or uh, next slide, moving on to what uh, we would like to plant motion. So this is the exact same bell, pe uh, bell pepper and heat fertilizer experiment, except we looked at plant motion. Now, I'll try to do my best to explain it a little bit, but I want to show you all the next video to kind of get your mind going on what we're kind of aiming for. So next video or next uh, slide, please. So this is a really cool video of a, a, a vining plant trying to establish itself on a wooden stake. Um, and you can almost tell at one point, you know, it, it's a little frustrated. It's going to move. It's going to move around. Uh, I'll give it a little second. There we go. So, um, you know, then it also, you can see it kind of get a little larger, start going a little bit faster towards the camera. So what uh, we were trying to look at, like, that was a movement versus it wasn't necessarily growing. It was it was a, almost a conscious movement to make a change in its environment or a response to an applied variable or response to that that state being not in the optimal position. So we wanted to see, can we develop a code or can we alter a code to kind of pick out that data? Uh, so if we go to the next slide. So this is just a little um, information on what we were actually able to achieve. So this is um, the pictures derived uh, that made that video. Um, this is capture uh, 74,248 compared to capture 74,400. Um, and what it's looking at is uh, with the plant uh, imaging, the previous one is looking at the increase in pixels. This one is looking at the ch I guess the change in pixels. So it's it's taking into account the current position of pixels, where they are um, where they have moved to, and the fact that there's a lack of pixels that were previously an area of pixels. So it's almost like a comparison. Um, and then it outputs this final image in the bottom left corner, and that's the difference between the two. Uh, so it, it it's showing the plants, I guess, movement because it not it's not expanding upon the current pixels like the other one it knows that hey there was pixels here now there's not there what there wasn't a pixel here and now there is um and then we can take those data points and even graph it and this is the graph of the actual movement of that plant 
Um, so you can see right there in that middle section, that's when it actually was like, man, forget this. I can't get on the stake this way. I'm going to go move around. And so that, that was just really exciting to see that we were able to really display that in a graph. Uh, all right, next slide, please. Uh, this should be a video if you can, if you can play it. So um, we're not limited to only singular plants. We can do uh, like germination. Oh, is it playing? Oh, it's a plan for you guys. Oh, there we go. Okay, cool. Um, so these are tomato plants, and you can almost see it moves a little bit there, and then it pauses a little bit, and then it moves again. Um, and those are really reflected in the graph as well. But it really highlights the fact too is like you're not limited to to just singular plants. If you want to look at germination studies, if you want to look at group studies, as long as you can set that specific threshold to green or or to pick out the colors that you want, you can monitor a group of plants for I guess a group movement as well as as well as like I guess group pixel increase or size increase. Uh, next slide, please. So just to blow your mind a little bit. Uh, this was all achieved on a standard RGB Logitech Pro 9000 uh, webcam. Uh, we're not using some state-of-the-art, you know, something crazy. Like we could pick this off Amazon and, and we are getting so much uh, like really cool data just by applying so many diverse variables to the plant, whether it be fertilizers, endophytes, to testing of fungicides, uh, uh, pretty much anything. Um, but moving forward, I I was like, well, what if we adapted even more high tech uh, cameras or uh, because if I was able to, again, intern at the Institute under the drone program and they had a bunch of um, of really high tech cameras like the Microsense Red Edge, which has five lenses of red, green, blue, near infrared and uh, red edge, I believe. And then the Fleerview Pro, which is a thermal camera. So if we're getting so many cool so much cool data points just from a standard webcam. I just could you imagine what it would be like to 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 apply a new camera to it such as this? But it's a little bit of a, a, a I can't just I can't go in and plug a new camera in because a little code we're working with uh, communicates through ports on the computer. Um, whereas a webcam, you can just slide in a USB and it knows it's there. It knows when to communicate with it. Whereas these more high tech cameras operate on an SD card. So it's not really a um, it's just a little bit of a communication error. But eventually, um, I think it is doable. And I would like to try to work. Oh, I'm going to work on trying to implement it so we can see what kind of data we can pull from changing up the uh, cameras. Uh, next slide, please. Well, I know I just wanted to leave you guys with this and just show you the, the uh, I guess, diversity of the smart table. Um, it's not just meant for some special lab. It can be in the ease of a, of a classroom. We're working with Hargrave Military Academy in Chatham, Virginia, which is about uh, 20 minutes north of Danville, where the Institute is located. Um, and we recently installed a smart table there with the same uh, same setup as we have here. Um, working with the environmental science teacher uh, to implement uh, programs and and uh, goals for the students to to hopefully conduct research of their own or to work with them to do preliminary research for us um, just to get them interested in the STEM field, whether it be horticulture, plant science, coding robotics, uh, working with their hands on just like machinery, what, whatever it may be. But it's just showing the versatility of the smart table and uh, and the the just the kind of the outreach we are to able to have with the with the younger kids and help make them feel like a part of a program. So I'm really excited to see what we can do. Uh, I think in two weeks we got some seeds ready to go. We're going to transplant them down there. We're going to do just some preliminary stuff with them. So that's just even more data points we're going to collect at a separate location. So, um, but uh, that's what I just wanted to end with. So thank you very much for your time. We had one question in the chat, in the Q&A, sorry, and that is, I believe you already mentioned this, but it's just to reiterate, what cameras are being used in these experiments? Maybe there's multiple types. Um, just to, in summary, what cameras are being used? Thanks. Okay, uh, for the smart table or for the Canon thing? Probably, they asked at 2.30, so it seems like the Canon thing, and then also it seems like you had already started talking about the smart table at that point, so maybe they're wondering if Canon was also used for the smart table or something different. Well, I cannot comment on the Canon one, Canon one but I will say, uh, I, I'm like I said, I'm just using the uh, standard uh, Logitech Pro uh, 9000 uh, webcam. And I think at one point there was a Logitech it's like C920 or something, but it's just standard RGB webcam. Uh, so.
Great. Um, any other questions from attendees? We welcome your questions or comments. Um, I have some questions. I was uh, <laughs> going to go back to um, the Canon section and ask Dr. South a question first. So um, as you're investigating these different um, treatments and seeing the impact on nutrient deficiencies, are you able to, in some ways, quantify waste as well um, by perhaps maybe it's wasted nutrients, wasted water, wasted energy? I was curious, as a person focused on efficiency, I was curious if there's some findings on that no, that's a really good question. That is not something yet that we've started looking into. That's something that we're interesting in quantifying, not only for something for like this project. And I think it would be very interesting to be able to tie it back to the data that we are collecting in these in this specific project with the Canon, um, with their imaging technology. Um, but in our other systems and our other projects as well, we are starting to explore um, while we're running our regular projects, maybe with different treatments, um, adding that as another parameter in the data that we are collecting. So hooking up um, equipment to be able to um, log the energy that's being used over the entirety of the project. And then at the end, quantifying the waste, whether that be the roots and the propagation cubes, or um, maybe it's like ones, you know, we just have to throw out, like how can we also incorporate that into our normal growth parameters that we're already collecting? And then can we um, connect it with the treatments that we're applying? And then how can we incorporate um, that into what we're collecting um, both in our in, with our imaging projects as well. Like how can we bring that in? So that's a very good question and something that we're either already implementing and hope to soon continue to implement in the parameters that we're collecting. Yeah, that's great. I, I really appreciate you mentioning monitoring and that there is already collection happening and there's more parameters that be, could be collected. I've found that energy is not often one of the things being monitored, even while all this other data is being collected. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your answer. Um, we got a question from the chat, I believe in response to Mitchell's last answer, which is, um, are you not doing thermal imaging with the same platform? Are you uh, doing thermal imaging? No, we, we are, well, currently we are not. Uh, like I said, it's a little bit of a, uh, a, a gap to bridge with the communication between the computer, the code. Um, it communicates through ports um, and being a thermal camera with an SD card, it, it, it doesn't, it won't know it's there. <laughs> so I need to find a way to communicate use an SD port, uh, SD port with the um, computer itself. So uh, I'm sure it's a simple fix, but uh, it's something I would like to move on to in the eventual future. Thanks for the question. Follow up, um, I think again, related to both imaging projects, how do you cope with larger plants with the imaging technology? Do you have to add a second view angle, perhaps from the side? Uh, do you want to, oh, let me say you can go ahead, Mitchell. Um, so, uh, primarily I've only, like, I've only dealt with lettuce, which is more or less, uh, not, not growing towards the camera as much as others might deal with. Um, I think, uh, we do have a 3d scanner that we eventually want to implement into it to kind of add in that extra, uh, cooperate uh i guess accounting for error as the plant grows towards the, the, um, camera. Um, but, uh, as of now, it's just we try to stick with plants that um, we can just limit to the surface, the t upper surface area, like canopy, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the smart tables, we have the um, the fixed camera. And so the plants that are growing up towards the camera, we have issues being able to capture the growth over time without needing to go back and measure um, change or height adjustment for where those plants are located in um, in relation to where the camera is. And so um, looking at options like 3D imaging or how can we adjust our setup to be able to capture that because right now we are capturing just the top down view and then looking at how that is correlating back to our um, growth measurements that we are tracking over time more manually versus through the robotic arm. Um, so that's that's how we're what we're doing with this smart tape or the smart platforms right now. Yeah, I imagine 3D imaging, just you as, as you were talking about the amount of data with just the 2D imaging, you may end up having a lot of data to deal with and correlate and clean. <laughs> so it's an admirable 
goal, but I imagine it can be a challenge to execute. Okay, um, we have just a few more minutes for questions. So if anybody has more questions they'd like to ask to follow up with the researchers or even just questions about the CEA Innovation Center in general, um, I'm going to ask quest one question to Mitchell and this is about the, the presentation you made. And so it was talking about how you can correlate the both the yield of the plant from the number of pixels as well as from the harvest weight, right? Yes. And so the argument is that the smart platform can make conclusions about um, plant development via plant size from the top rather than having to weigh plants. Mm -hmm. Do you see this as a way to avoid having to weigh plants or a way to add additional data to uh, research? Um, I, well, I definitely feel like people always want to aim towards taking out a step in their production cycle. Um, being a researcher, I definitely look for it to just increase the amount of data to support my findings. And that's what I'm implementing it for, but I, I don't want to answer it too abruptly because I do know people would like to say, hey, yeah, we can do this instead of Wayne. But from my point of view, I enjoy the fact it's just another data point to support my findings. Yeah, I wonder from if thinking about the commercialization of this, like, and how it might be for a commercial greenhouse beneficial to be able to just image. Any thoughts on that, Dr. South? Oh, yeah, I, I agree, um, both for um, commercial purposes and then for research. Um, as Mitchell said, it's um, it's a good data point to add. But then for us, um, we don't have to have as many replicates because we don't need to do destructive harvest over time if we're needing to be able to capture data over time. So this allows us to see treatments that may have an early effect after we transplant versus at the very end of the project when we're only capturing weight data at the very end. And so we're able to reduce our replicate number and then capture that over time. So this, this was a cool experiment to be, for us to be able to understand that we can use the table in those instances to see differences between treatments. We did use a very obvious um, treatment of having a very low to 0%. Um, we added no fertilizer, just water to, to the plant. So we expected there to be a difference. And so that was a really good way for us to be able to show that we can use this um, to be able to see differences. And um, whenever we do treatments where we're very interested in what the result may be. And so the last question I'll ask is uh, for, for Mike, as you think about the goals of the CEA um, Innovation Center, is the one of the goals to commercialize these technologies that the researchers have been investigating? Um, is it the goal to see this become, you know, outside of the lab and in other research facilities and in commercial greenhouses? Yeah, absolutely. And from the technology sort of commercialization, there's a couple of angles. One is, right, people in the CEA Center, our faculty, you know, bringing in people that aren't even normally in CEA to bring their expertise it may be new technologies that are created at the center, right? And, and say Virginia Tech and, and its patent may spin off or new technology, IP. Uh, but sort of the example with a Canon, for example, is we also are working with existing companies that have a lot of technology and know-how, but they weren't in the agricultural field, right? Or the CEA field. Can we partner with them right, to help them find these new markets for their products, including in CEA or broader agriculture. Going back to that mission of economic development, all of those things then potentially, right, depending on how they play out, uh, besides helping the CEA industry, the ag industry, potentially create jobs, which again is one of the missions of the Institute, so it feeds that mission. So absolutely multiple ways. Well, I'd like to thank you all for a really amazing presentation and for a great showcase of what Virginia is up to. Uh, thank you for your insights on the research side of things. I learned a lot about optics and about how you all are um, developing more smart ways to perform research that hopefully will also have ripple effects on the commercial industry. Um, a comment in the uh, in the chat mentions a little bit about how Xbox Connect has been used. Um, I think I've heard about that as well a little bit. Um, if we have any other questions or comments, we do have a couple minutes left, but since questions seem to be dwindling down, I was thinking about uh, just closing out the webinar and thanking everyone for attending. Just a reminder that the uh, upcoming webinar for Glaze will be from Agritecture in 
October. And in November, we'll have our final webinar of the year from the University of Georgia. I really appreciate all of you attending and for your insightful questions and answers. Let me know if you need anything. My email will be dropped in the chat. And if you're interested in joining Blaze to access member benefits, please reach out. Thank you to everyone who is here. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks.